So here we have the Khan Academy's Command of Evidence Textual Questions, uh, the advanced level. Uh, I refer to these as strength and weaken questions, although not all of them are strength and weaken questions. Some of them are quotation questions, but this is what we're looking at here. And somehow I wound up with 14 of these, so this is going to be a long video. I'm going to try to be as concise as I can with my explanations. About 14 questions, and given that these can be somewhat complex, could take a while, so uh, dig in. So number one, archaeologists have held that the Kassarab culture, I don't know how to pronounce that, so we'll just pretend, uh, which emerged in the southwestern Amazon basin in the first millennium CE AD, was characterized by a sparse, widely distributed population and little intervention in the surrounding wilderness. So sparse and widely distributed means that in no particular area is there like a great concentration or dense uh, population. And then they're not intervening in the surrounding wilderness. They're not chopping down trees or, or building roads. Okay, so recently, however, so... This is how they have thought about things. But recently, we've got a change here. This archaeologist conducted a study using remote sensing technology that enabled them to create three-dimensional images of the jungle-covered landscape from above, and the researchers concluded that the Kassarab people developed a form of urbanism. Okay, so urbanism is contrasted with this sparse, widely distributed population. So urbanism, we're going to have clusters and then another cluster over here maybe. And then maybe there are roads leading from one to the other. You would never know that those were supposed to be two urban areas with a road. <laughs> it looks like some kind of biological drawing. But in any event, that sort of evidence would support their conclusion. Something that supports the idea that there were cities and some sort of intervention in the uh, local uh, wilderness. So the, if they show shapes consistent with widely separated settlements of roughly equal size surrounded by uncultivated jungle, that would weaken their conclusion. That would support the old way of thinking. But we want to strengthen it. And that's usually what they're going to do with these. They're going to have at least one or one that uh, does the opposite of what they ask for. Uh, B, they show shapes consistent with long-distance footpaths running from Kassarab territories to large cities outside the region. Okay, that's another thing they like to do, is to throw in something that's just irrelevant. Their conclusion has to do with the Kassarab people, not with uh, people who lived outside that region. They show shapes consistent with monumental platforms, monumental platforms and dense central settlements dense central settlements linked to smaller settlements by a system of canals and roadways. Okay, so that's got more detail, but, you know, canals, roadways, uh, urbanism, that is good. They show shapes consistent with scattered small farms created by clearing jungle areas near sources of fresh water. Well, that does part of it. That talks about intervening in nature a little bit, clearing jungle areas, but small farms and urbanism don't go together. So our answer there is going to be C. Which claim, which finding about these things would most directly support Zhang's claim? So in the 1980s, many musicians and journalists in the English-speaking world began to draw attention to music from around the globe, such as this from South Africa and that from Vietnam, that can't be easily categorized according to British or North American popular music genres typically referring to such music as world music. While some scholars have welcomed this development for bringing diverse musical forms to prominence in countries where they'd previously been overlooked, musicologist Su Zhang claims that the concept of world music homogenizes highly distinct traditions by reducing them to a single category. I hate crooked lines like that. Okay, so what does it mean to homogenize? Uh, you might not be familiar with that as a verb, but we can think of, well, homogeneous, homogeneous, depending on how you prefer to pronounce that. But something that's hom homogeneous or homogeneous. <laughs> I 
I can't remember if there's an E there or not. Anyway, it's something that is uniform, all the same, like homogenized milk. Um, <clears throat> and to homogenize distinct traditions is to take them and put them all in a single category. So instead of having, you know, distinct genres like uh, this one or that one or some other styles and, and it's sort of approaching them on their own terms, they just go under the category of world music. To use another vocabulary word, you could say they are all subsumed under the heading of world music. Subsumed. Okay. And something that would support that would be, you know, the idea that you've got distinct traditions placed into a single category. And so looking at answer choice A, no, no, because there's nothing about popularity. If these styles developed independently of each other and have little in common musically, that would mean that they are indeed distinct. And we already know that they are categorized as world music. That is a good answer. C, they are now performed by a diverse array of musicians with no direct, if anything, that would I mean, that wouldn't strengthen it uh, because it's not, I mean, I don't know, would that strengthen it? I mean, they're certainly not going to strengthen it or support it um, if they're performed by a diverse, I guess that would, that would kind of go against it because it would be making it sound like those aren't really distinct traditions if, if they're played by people all over the world maybe that would support the idea that there they could be kind of international world music. Um, and then D, they're highly distinct from British, but similar to each other. That would definitely weaken the claim because if they're similar to each other, it would make sense to put them in the same category. But she's arguing against that. Three, neural networks are computer models intended to reflect the organization of human brains and are often used in studies of brain function. According to an analysis, these people advise caution when drawing conclusions about human brains. And we're going to try to support that claim. So uh, from observations of neural networks, they found when attempting to mimic or simulate grid cells, that kind of brain cell used in navigation, complex sentence structure alert, they found that when attempting to do, to do this, while 90% of the networks could accomplish navigation-related tasks, only about 10% of those exhibited any behavior similar to those of grid cells. That's not a very well-written sentence, I have to say. Um, they could have said, when attempting to mimic grid cells, 90% of the networks could accomplish navigation-related tasks, but only about 10% of those yeah, that would be easier to read, and I don't think um, there would be any reason not to not to use but instead of while there. Anyway, uh, even this approximation of grid cell activity has less to do with the similarity between the neural networks and biological brains than it does with the rules programmed into the networks. Okay, so neural networks are not like the brain in some important sense. They don't behave like the brain they maybe accomplish similar tasks but they do so in very different ways according to very different mechanisms or um, patterns or whatever so something that supports the idea that neural networks and brains are very different so the rules that allow for neuro for networks to exhibit behaviors like those of grid cells those rules have no equivalent in the function of biological brains that's pretty good but let's check the others. The networks that do not exhibit behaviors like those of grid cells were nonetheless programmed with rules. No, that's irrelevant. We're not talking about earlier neural network studies. Once a neural network is programmed, it is trained on certain tasks to see if it can independently arrive at processes that are, well, no, that would, I don't think that would weaken it, but it certainly it wouldn't support it. We're not trying to, to show that they're similar. We're trying to emphasize that they're different. Neural networks can often accomplish tasks that biological brains do, but they are typically programmed with rules. To Well, it's not about whether they model multiple types of brain cells simultaneously. Um, that, If anything, that would weaken it because 
we want something that actually like at maybe at a cellular cellular level or at some biological level actually mimics what brains do as opposed to merely accomplishing the same uh, tasks um, <clears throat> you know you could think of it like a, a an electric car and a internal combustion engine they both have the same function but they Func they work in different ways. They both, you know, are, are for transportation and driving around, but they have different inner workings. That's the kind of thing here. So A is going to be the correct answer there. Another support question. So in vertical inheritance, parents pass genes to their offspring, but in horizontal transfer, one species, often bacteria, passes genetic material to an unrelated species. Okay, so parents, offspring, so we can see why they call it vertical because it's, you know, from one generation to the other, whereas horizontal, I don't know, we've got one organism of one type, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a human or even an animal, they're going that direction. I don't know why I did blobs there, but, but anyway, horizontal versus vertical. Okay, in a 2022 study, Herpetologist, that's someone who studies herpes? No, no, that's somebody who studies frogs. I'm not sure why, but it is. Or um, reptiles, maybe, just in general. Reptiles, amphibians. I'm not sure exactly what herpetologists do, but they study frogs in any event. Uh, they investigated horizontal transfer in multicellular organisms, namely snakes and frogs in Madagascar. The team detected BOVB, a gene transmitted vertically in snakes. They detected it in many frog species. The apparent direction of gene transfer seems counterintuitive because frogs usually don't survive encounters with snakes. Okay, so the idea here is they detected it, they transmitted vertically in, in uh, snakes but they found it in frog species and that's from one to another okay so this is okay i'm going to draw a snake um this is going to be the worst snake drawing you've ever seen okay snake and then likewise this will be the worst frog you've ever seen i'm going to just do a smiley frog um that, I don't know where's where is, I, mean, I told you that's even worse than I, I thought it was going to be but uh, horizontal okay so they detected it in many frog species that's horrible the apparent direction of gene transfer seems counterintuitive because frogs usually don't survive encounters with snakes the snakes would eat them and so they wouldn't be able to transmit the newly acquired gene to off to their offspring which would in turn be vertical uh, but the team concluded that it is indeed transmitted from snakes to frogs, either directly or indirectly via horizontal transfer. So something that supports the conclusion that this gene, whatever that gene does, uh, is transmitted either directly or indirectly in a horizontal fashion that is from snakes to frogs. Because snakes could not pass something vertically to frogs because in order for that to happen, a snake would have to give birth to a frog. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Okay. Um, so, what would support it? Frog species show few discernible advantages. No, 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 no. It's not at all about the advantages or disadvantages uh, resulting from possessing that gene or not. Um, yeah. BOVB can be transmitted across. No. That, that's not relevant because we want to know whether it can be transmitted from snakes to frogs. It cannot be reliably transmitted from a snake species to bacteria that are usually encountered by frog species. Well, that would weaken it because, as it said in the beginning, often bacteria, not always, but often, and, but, but if it cannot be readily transmitted by these bacteria, that would, yeah, that would weaken it. Parasites known to feed on species of snakes and frogs in which the BOVB gene occurs also carry BOVB. And that's going to be our answer. So we're going to add another um, thing into our, our drawings here. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got a parasite. I don't know, some kind of little bug. Okay, a parasite that feeds on snakes. And then it leaves the snake and then it goes and feeds on the frog. I guess that frog should have been green to begin with. But uh, maybe it's... It, 
in the process of doing this. I don't know. It passes some genetic material along in some way that such that it gets into the to the snake. I don't know how, but I don't know. Um, and likewise, you know, and then it then it feeds on the snake, and and uh, I don't know. We don't have to get too into the actual mechanisms, but I think we can at least see it's somewhat plausible that this gene could be transmitted because again it's the only thing that could account for this and even though um, a parasite is not a bacteria or bacteria I don't think bacteria ever play the role of parasites um, it's the same kind of thing it's a it's a it's a creature that lives inside of other creatures uh, you know it's an organism I should say that lives inside of other organisms and that would be the means in which horizontal transfer could occur here so long question there several studies of sediment for example, dirt, pieces of rock, etc., in streams have shown an inverse correlation between sediment size and downstream distance from the primary sediment source, suggesting that stream length has a sorting effect on sediment. And the first thing I would say here is some kind of sketch or diagram is going to be helpful here. And I would say, you know, your objection might be, well, I don't have time to do that. Yes, you do. You, what you don't have time to do is read something, not understand it, go back and read it again and still not understand it, and then start thinking about something else and lose your focus, and before you know it, you've spent three minutes and you haven't gotten anywhere. So an inverse correlation means that as one goes up, the other one goes down. So sediment grain size, what on earth does that mean? small grain size would be here little tiny little pieces of sand or dirt and then these are bigger pebbles or rocks or whatever and then these are in the middle um, so as it gets as the sediment grain size increases the downstream distance decreases so what does downstream distance mean well there's gonna be some okay here's our stream and then what, what it's saying here is the ones that are found, let's say that the sediment is somehow coming into the stream. I don't know exactly how or why, but uh, what it's saying here is that the grain size gets smaller the farther you are away. So you're going to have big pieces up here and medium pieces here and small pieces farther away. That's, again, not a great drawing, but... Yeah. Okay, in a study of sediment sampled at more than a dozen sites in alpine streams, streams in the Alps, however, these geologists found that cross-site variations in grain size, so variations in grain size from one site to another, were not associated with differences in downstream distance, differences in downstream distance, though they did not conclude that downstream distance is irrelevant to grain size. Okay, they did not conclude that. What did they conclude? They concluded that sediment influx, inflow of uh, in these streams may have been sufficiently spatially diffuse. What does spatially diffuse mean? Well, diffuse as a verb is and that means to to spread out in space, like to diffusion, which you know from biology, I would imagine. Spatially diffuse means spread out. So the influx, what I this this drawing here, I had one point of influx, but it could be that you know you have multiple points of influx, such that even if there is this sorting effect that causes uh, smaller pieces to travel farther or pieces that travel farther to be smaller, if you have multiple points of influx, then you're not going to find that same. Uh, correlation that they found before that same negative correlation because again uh, you might have small pieces coming from this point of influx showing up around here but then large pieces coming from this other point of influx so something that would support it would be something that would well show that there are multiple points of influx uh, a the stream contains several types of sediment that are not typically found in streams where the sorting effect has been demonstrated. Hmm. 
Uh, I don't, that's, that's complex. I don't know about that. I'm going to put a question mark there. The streams are fed by multiple tributaries. So tributaries, things that flow into the, the main stream. Um, that carry significant volumes of sediment and that entered the streams downstream of the sampling sites. Well, if they enter downstream of the sampling sites, downstream means, you know, well, if this is a sampling site and these things come in downstream of the sampling site, that's not going to affect things. If they came in upstream, that would that would make a difference because then that, that stuff that comes in through the tributaries would then flow and pass by uh, or at least have some impact on what is found at the sampling sites. Uh, C, the streams mostly originate from the same source but their links vary considerably due to the different courses they take. Hmm. Well, I don't think the length itself is what matters. It's the fact that there could be multiple points of, of influx, as it says, uh, sufficiently diffuse. So D, the streams regularly experience portions of their banks collapsing into the water at multiple points upstream of the sampling sites. Yes, upstream of this. Yeah. So if their sampling sites are, let's say, down here in this fictional river, uh, and then you have the the banks collapsing at different points, then those are going to be like your points of influx. Where did they say? Yes, yeah, sediment. And that's going to be sediment influx because you've got yeah the banks collapsing, and then you've got kind of all kinds of rocks and dirt, etc. And so if they regularly experience that, that's going to be what provides those multiple points of, of influx. So coming back to A, I think that's irrelevant. The streams contain several types of sediment. That are not typically found. Sorting effect from being observed. Yeah, I'd have to come back to that one. And I'll, if there are more questions about why A isn't correct, I might actually go back and look at what the Khan Academy says. It's not quite clicking, but it's just not. It doesn't seem relevant to the answer, or to the to the conclusion. And so we're going to go with E and move on. Number six in the 1970s, and here we're switching over to weakened questions. So still, we want to make sure to first understand the underlying claim. Okay, so in the 1970s, a roughly 60,000-year-old piece of hyena bone, like a laughing hyena, marked with nine notches, was discovered at a site in western France that was once inhabited by Neanderthals. Although many believe that only modern humans developed systems for notating numbers, one archaeologist asserts that this artifact, this piece of hyena bone, marked with nine notches, yeah, a hyena bone on itself would not be considered an artifact. An artifact is something that shows evidence that humans worked with it. Yeah, I guess you could sometimes have animal artifacts if animals, you know, like crows, uh, modify like stuff. I mean, a bird's nest would be an artifact. I think you could say that. But anyway, uh, this artifact may be a sign that Neanderthals also recorded numerical information. That, new, that not just modern humans, but also new Neanderthals did this. The notches on the bone are unevenly spaced, but approximately parallel, and microscopic analysis reveals that they were made with a single stone tool. According to the archaeologist, this suggests that the notches were all made at one time by one individual as a means of counting something. Okay, so the, basically what it's saying here is that the notches are evidence that these Neanderthals counted stuff. Okay, so something that would weaken it would, would be something that would suggest that no, they're not necessarily evidence that the Neanderthals counted stuff. Maybe there's some other explanation for why those notches uh, exist. Parallel lines are a common feature in many modern humans' systems for recording numerical information. No, that would support it. 
More than nine approximately parallel, parallel notches made with a different stone tool are present on another artifact. Well, that doesn't tell us anything because we don't know why those notches were there or whether they had anything to do with counting. See, it would have taken careful effort to make evenly spaced. Well, no, that, that really supports the idea that it was some kind of human intervention. D, decorative art discovered at another Neanderthal site in Western France primarily features patterns of unevenly spaced parallel lines. Yeah, so the notches or lines could be evidence so of, of something else, meaning that those notches are not necessarily evidence that the Neanderthals counted or were recording numerical information. And so this would weaken it. Note that weaken... Weakening an argument is not the same thing as refuting it or demolishing it or showing that it's necessarily false. It's just casting a little doubt on it. It's just saying, well, you, you know, like in this case, the, the archaeologist is saying this one thing. D is suggesting, well, it could be this other thing. And that's enough to weaken it. And that's all we have to do. Number seven, potential explanation, weakening that. So many governments that regularly transfer money to individuals, for example, to provide supplemental incomes for senior citizens, have long done so electronically, but other countries typically have distributed physical money and have only recently developed electronic transfer infrastructure. So like the um, computer systems and whatnot needed to connect banks and, and et cetera to, to people. So the, uh, that technology, okay. So many governments have done this for a long time, but other countries have only recently done it. Researchers studied the introduction of an electronic transfer system in one such location and found that recipients of electronic transfers consumed a different array or variety of foods than recipients of physical transfers. Okay, so the physical people who got f like physical money, like there's a dollar bill or whatever, uh, they eat... We're going to say they eat um, vegetables and steak. I don't know. And then the people who have the electronic money, I don't know. Pretend this is a this is a QR code. I don't know. I can <laughs> try to draw a QR code. That's impossible. Okay. Um, okay. They eat um, Twinkies. Do people still eat Twinkies? Twinkies and uh, and drink um, um, uh, Red Bull. I don't know. Okay, one potential explanation is that individuals conceive of and allocate funds in physical money differently than they conceive of and allocate funds in electronic form. So I don't know why it would cause one group to eat Twinkies and drink Red Bulls and the other ones to buy vegetables and steak, um, but let's just suppose. Okay, what would weaken it? So something that would show that they don't necessarily conceive of this differently maybe, maybe, maybe they're different places. Maybe like here to get physical money, you have to go to an actual bank, whereas electronic money you can spend at a local gas station, a convenience store. So recipients of electronic transfers typically spend their funds at a slower rate. Well, that's not relevant here. We want to know why they buy different kinds of food. Some recipients of physical transfers receive small amounts of money frequently. Well, it's not about the frequency. It's about the type. Receipts of physical transfers, recipients of physical transfers tended to purchase food about as frequently. No. Nearly every recipient of an electronic transfer withdrew the entire amount in physical money shortly after receiving the transfer. Well, that makes sense. It's not what I would have initially thought of, but if, if, they withdrew the entire amount in physical money, then the fact that they received it in electronic form on their mobile device, I know that does not look like that, it doesn't really matter because they immediately now have money and now we're left to explain why is it that these people are buying Twinkies and Red Bulls while these other people are eating healthy food. I think steak is still healthy, um, depending on how it's cooked. Um, that can't be explained in terms of conceptions of money because ultimately they both have physical money, even if these people over here first received it in electronic form. And so again, we're not demolishing it. We're not showing that they absolutely uh, do think about money in similar ways. We're just showing that this can't really explain the differences in the kind of food that they're buying. 
Another weekend question here. So in a recent study, researchers grew rice in chambers with varying levels of carbon dioxide. Somehow they couldn't come up with a subscript there. Uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, to simulate different atmospheric conditions. They found that as CO2 levels increased, the nutritional content of the rice changed. Okay, so another little graph here. So CO2 level increase this changed okay the rice contained less protein iron and zinc so I'm gonna make one line here for um, I don't know protein iron and zinc and I'm just gonna say amount of whatever amount of X protein iron and zinc but more carbohydrates so this increases that increases this increases, that decreases. One potential explanation for these findings is that since CO2 is an important input to photosynthesis, the elevated carbon dioxide levels could be spurring the plants to photosynthesize, to engage in photosynthesis more rapidly. This, in turn, could lead to increased carbohydrate production at the expense of other nutrients like protein, iron, and zinc. Okay. So more CO2, according to this hypothesis, hypothesis means more photosynthesis, and that means more carbs. Okay. Weaken. Something that would, would break this chain of reasoning. Rice plants consumed carbon dioxide at nearly identical rates regardless of variations in atmospheric CO2 levels. Atmosphere. Okay, so let's say that we have chambers with varying levels, and so let's say we have three. Okay, here's here's a chamber one that has a low level. Here's chamber two that has a medium level, and here's chamber three that has a high level. Okay, well, supposing that you increase the 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 level of CO two you might think, well, that's going to mean more photosynthesis. But if it turns out that increasing the level of carbon dioxide doesn't have any effect on... <laughs> yeah, the consumption of carbon dioxide is going to be a sort of a proxy for, a proxy, a, a, um, a way of indicating how much photosynthesis they're undertaking. If they consume more CO2, they are, under, they are photosynthesizing more. But the idea here is that, well, if they consume carbon dioxide at nearly identical rates, regardless of these variations, then what does that mean? It means that more atmospheric CO2 doesn't necessarily lead to more photosynthesis, and that in turn would not explain the observations. So I think A is going to be correct, but the others, protein production suffered more, nope. See, protein and zinc are, are grouped together, so we don't want to make a distinction between them. Rice plants grew more quickly overall in low CO2 than high CO2. We're not talking about overall growth. We're talking about differences in protein, iron, and zinc on the one hand versus carbohydrates on the other. Carbohydrate production increased and then plateaued as CO2 levels increased. So to increase and then plateau would be to flatten out eventually. But... That, I can see how that could be tempting. But if it increased and then plateaued, that wouldn't weaken it. Because if your prediction was increased carbohydrate production, if it does something like that, I would still call that an increase. Because relative to where it starts, it's still going up. It doesn't matter if it's you know, eventually plateauing, just like it wouldn't matter if it, if it did something like that, if it took a while to get going and then went up. It's still increasing. So that doesn't do it. Okay, nine. Electra is a play written circa 420 to 410 BC by Sophocles, translated in 1870 by R.C. Jebb. Electra, who is mourning for her dead father and her long absent brother, is aware of the intensity of her grief but believes it to be justified. So here we're moving on to a different kind of question. Uh, still command of evidence textual, but looking for a quote. So something that indicates that she is both aware of the intensity of her grief, 
but uh, that she believes it to be justified. And yes, this language is tough, but we should still be able to find a, a tangible clue in the correct answer. Multiple clues, one that connects to the red part and one that connects to the yellow part. So, O oh, thou pure sunlight and thou air, your, you know, earth's canopy, how often have ye, have you heard the strains of my lament, the wild blows dealt against this bleeding breast when dark night falls? Well, that's a lot of fancy words, but nothing about believing it to be justified, regardless of what it might say about grief. I mean, grief and lament do connect, so I'll give it that. But nothing about believing it to be justified. I know my passion. It escapes me not. So she's aware of it. It doesn't escape her. But seeing that the causes are so dire, so serious, so severe, we'll never curb these frenzied plaints. So what is a plaint? I mean, that's not a word you hear every day, but complaint. A plaint is a grievance, grief. So basically she's not going to stop. It's justified because the causes are so dire. Her brother and her her dad are, are gone. Or her, yeah, they're gone. So that connects to both parts, and that should be our correct answer. But let's just see the others. Send to, whoops, <laughs> I didn't mean to circle that. Send to me my brother, for I have no more the strength to bear up alone against the load of grief that weighs me down. Well, again, there's that word, but that doesn't mean that it says anything about being aware of the intensity of it or believing it to be justified. And I guess the believing it to be justified is the better reason not to, to, to pick because it, it really doesn't say anything about that. Okay, and then D, but I will never cease from dirge and sore lament. This is just saying she's never going to stop. So this is tough because all of the wrong answers have some kind of synonym, but we just we need to make sure, you know, we, we see in this case the claim. The claim has two parts, and so our answer needs to connect to both of those parts. Another of the same type here. So Mr. Cornelius Johnson, Office Seeker, is a nineteen hundred story by Paul Laurent Dun Dunbar. In the story, the narrator describes Mr. Cornelius Johnson's appearance as conveying his exaggerated sense of his importance. So his physical appearance conveys or expresses the fact that he has an, a, an inflated sense of how important he is. He always carried himself as if he were passing under his own triumphal arch. Right, there is something, I don't know where it is specifically, is it in pair Arc de Triomphe? triumphal arch so if he were passing underneath his triumphal arch it would be like he's carrying it with him or passing under it and that would certainly you know his appearance how he carried himself that he's passing under his own triumphal arch I think that's going to be correct but let's see the gray Prince Albert was scrupulously buttoned scrupulous scrupulously can basically mean careful, carefully buttoned, care, like with a lot of attention to detail. Buttoned about his form and a shiny top hat replaced the felt of the afternoon. That just says he's a careful dresser, not that he had an exaggerated sense of importance. He always spoke in a large and important tone. Well, speaking is not appearance. It was a beautiful day in balmy May and the sun shone pleasantly on Mr. Cornelius Johnson's very, very spruce Prince Albert suit of gray. Very spruce? I don't know what that means. Prince Albert suit of gray as he alighted from the train. Well, that just says the sun, sh sun shone, shun sown pleasantly, and that's not correct. So he carried himself this way, and that is going to be our correct answer. So, Valia, or Valia, is the 820 is a 1907 short story by Leonid Andreev. In the story, the author emphasizes that the setting, and here, you know, I included this in the advance. I'm not sure that it really was advanced because I can remember this one, and I remember it being pretty easy. The setting where the character is reading is nearly silent. Everything in the room was quiet so quiet that the only thing 
to be heard was the rustling of the pages turned. So the rustling of the pages turned, not crossing that out, rustling of the pages turned, reading. So the others, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing about being quiet there. Uh, there's something about reading, but nothing about it quiet. D, no. So, yeah, I, I feel like that one is... I don't want to minimize it for if anyone found it difficult, but I think that is pretty easy because the only one that mentions anything about being nearly silent. We want something that one that gets at a specific one would be B. 13. Next to last question. Sense and Sensibility is an 1811 novel by Jane Austen. In the novel, Austen describes Marianne Dashwood's ability to persuade others of the rightness of her artistic judgments as is evident when Marianne visits John Willoughby, a potential suitor. Somebody who is, you know, wants to, to marry her, or at least go on some dates. Okay. Her ability to persuade others of the rightness of her art artistic judgments, something that, sh that indicates that that ability is evident. Above all, when she heard him declare that of music and dancing he was... When, when she heard him talk about music and dancing that he was passionately fond of, she gave him such a look of approbation, approval, as secured the largest share of his discourse to herself for the rest of his stay. Maybe, I mean, that has something to do with artistic judgment, but this is talking about her ability to persuade others Whereas in this case, she is basically saying that his judgments are right. But again, I wouldn't want to eliminate it just yet. B, their taste was strikingly alike. The same books, the same passages were idolized by each. Or if any difference appeared, any objection arose. It lasted no longer than until the force of her arguments and the brightness of her eyes could be displayed. Well, that's better because... You know, basically saying that they generally like the same stuff, but if they had differences, if he objected and said, I don't think this is so good, she would say, no, it is. Or maybe even she would just give a look, and he says, okay, it is good, whatever you say, I agree. So I think B is going to be correct. C, it was only necessary to mention any favorite amusement to engage her to talk. She could not be silent. Well, that just says she likes to talk. It doesn't say that she had the ability to persuade others. She might talk a lot, but people could say, oh, I, don't, I don't care what she has to say. And I don't even know what D was. I didn't capture that, but let's just say that B is the correct answer there. And then on to 14, a quotation that supports the assertion of the historians. So in 1534, King Henry VIII of England split with the Catholic Church and declared himself head of the Church of England, in part because this pope refused to annul, to basically to give him a divorce to annul to end his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Two years later, Henry VIII introduced a policy titled the Dissolution. So they're going to dissolve the monasteries, the places where the monks lived. And by 1540, that resulted in the closure of all Catholic monasteries in England and the confiscation or seizure of their estates. They took all their stuff. Some historians assert that the enactment uh, bringing into to place of this policy was primarily motivated by perceived financial opportunities. So they closed down the monasteries so that they could take all of their stuff. Monks in general don't have a lot of stuff, but maybe the monasteries did. Uh, something that supports the, the idea that it was motivated by perceived financial opportunities. So at the time of the dissolution, about 2% so, no, nothing at all about financial anything in A. In 1535, the year before enacting the dissolution, so he split with the Catholic Church there two years later. So, 1536, he enacted the dissolution. In 1535, he commissioned or, or paid for a survey of the value of church holdings in England. Hmm, he's saying, hmm, what kind of... What kind of stuff do you have that I might acquire? The work performed by sheriffs, bishops, and magistrates, judges, I think, uh, religious figures, began that January and was swiftly completed that summer. So here he's sizing up the assets and saying, hmm, I think I like, 
I think I like that uh, vase you have, and I think I like that uh, <laughs> that castle, and I think I like uh, whatever else. I'm trying to think of something in 1535 that might be. I think I like your your uh, gold, those gold bars in that safe. Okay, so that seems pretty good. See a contemporary description of the dissolution of the monasteries, Michael Sherbrooke's fall of the fall. It's old English spelling. Fall of the religious houses recounts. Contemporary means it was written at that time. Recounts witness testimony that monks were allowed to keep the contents of their cells. No. Because this would mean that that would contradict it. That would weaken it. Because that would show that um, if they're allowed to keep that stuff, then Henry VIII isn't taking it. And so that would suggest that he was not uh, financially motivated. And then D, the October 1536 revolt known as the Pilgrimage of Grace had several economic motives. Well, that's... That's not about the dissolution of the monastery. So they like to do that. They like to throw in some irrelevant stuff, often in the context of a complicated, lengthy answer choice. It's going to be B. He's sizing up what he could possibly take, and uh, then the year later he enacts this thing and says, yeah, guess what? We get to take your stuff. Okay, so that's going to do it for this long video. hope you found this helpful. Questions or comments, leave them below.